let me formally introduce Dr. Kirk Johnson. He is the director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History, and it's one of the largest of the Smithsonian museums. The collection has 126 million specimens and objects. Their annual visitorship is 7 million people. And their researchers publish 500 contributions about research from the Smithsonian. So uh, this is a wonderful national resource and um, something that is, must be very difficult to uh, be in charge of. I don't even want to imagine. Uh, there are some little known facts about Kirk. Did you know that he was uh, raised here in Seattle? in a community known as Beau Arts. Now, I said, oh yeah, that over there in Bellevue. No, no, it's not in Bellevue, it's near Bellevue. <laughs> so uh, when he was about 12 years old, well, since he was young, since he was six years old, his parents would, mother would drop him off at the Burke Museum. And when he was 12 years old, he met a Burke scientist who instilled in him his love of paleontology and uh, we firmly believe taught him everything he knows about museums today. <laughs> he went on to uh, receive his PhD at, uh, Yale, um, at Yale University and then uh, got a job at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science where he rose through the ranks and became the Vice President of Research and Collections. Denver Museum of Nature and... So with that, I welcome Dr. Kirk Johnson. Indeed. So let me just get my presentation up here. And I'm good, I'm ready for slides. So uh, this is sort of a, a, a Rip Van Winkle tale. You remember Rip Van Winkle, 1819? He's a guy who lived in the Catskills, he wandered up into the hills and fell asleep, and he woke up 20 years later and he had slept through the Revolutionary War. His wife had died, he came back into town, nobody recognized him, everything was different. And uh, it's sort of great apocryphal tale of, of, of being a slothful guy. And that's, that's me, so I grew up here, it's been the first 18 years of my life, and then I went away for 35 years, and I've just come back. And this, this talk is really about the importance of museums and their role in helping us understand the rate at which things change. And things are changing so fast that it's been sort of interesting to come back to a place that I knew really well 35 years ago and look on with, with awe at what has changed um, both in the city from a sort of a city point of view but also in our understanding of how the city got to be here and how the landscape got to be here and what are the processes. And uh, it was this place that made me a a geologist and paleontologist, and it's amazing to come back and see this place surge forward in this amount of knowledge. So I was born in 1960 and arrived in Seattle a few months later, forever being unable to call myself a native, which traumatized me. I, was, <laughs> I got beat up when I was a kid because I wasn't a native. Um, but I was um, basically born the same time the Space Needle was, and when we lived, moved to Seattle, we lived right there. And as a baby, I watched that go up. It was pretty cool, apparently. I have no memory of that. <laughs> but I've always sort of anchored my time um, here as, as being born on the same time as the Space Needle. I was also a kid when the new Burke Museum opened in 1964. So the Space Needle and the Burke Museum kind of anchor my, my time in, in uh, Seattle. Um, I had great parents. My dad was in the Navy. He was a sailor and he was a hiker. And, uh, he went up Mount Rainier several times. Here's me at the age of one and a half on the flanks of Mount Rainier um, with my first pickaxe. <laughs> my mom was a Wyoming rancher's girl who really loved trees because where she came from they didn't have them. And she got me thinking about plants. And then uh, they took us 
out hiking a lot and out to the tide pools. And, and eventually I tumbled into this place, which many of you have probably tumbled into. This is the earlier iteration of Yule Curiosity Shop, which has been around in Seattle since the turn of the century in various venues. It's still down there on the waterfront. Um, but an amazing place that has all sorts of Northwest Coast Indian art and trinkets and walrus tusks and fossils and arrowheads. And it's, it is a curiosity generating machine. It's a commercial version of a museum. So between the Yale Curiosity Shop and National Geographic and the Burke Museum, I was pretty embedded in thinking about the natural world. My, my oldest, longest memory is actually an earthquake that happened here on April 29, 1965. The, the 6.7 earthquake that rocked Seattle knocked our chimney over. Um, but at the time, we didn't really worry about earthquakes. We thought the people who lived in California were stupid because there are dangerous earthquakes down there. And uh, so uh, as a kid, I started seeing things like this in, in the Yale Curiosity Shop at the museum, these cute little fossilized crabs in round rocks. And when I was about 10, when I saw these for the first time, I was like, God, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. And I became um, very convinced that I needed to go find some myself. And it took me a long time to figure out where to go. But eventually, after talking to rock hands and going to rock clubs and reading and going to the library, I found the beach where these things are. And it turns out these things are, the fossils in the Pacific Northwest are cryptic. They're, they're in stream cuts and they're on certain beaches and on other beaches. But I eventually found the beach. It was a, a Washington State Highway Department guy that um, showed me this beach. And I, he went down to the beach and I had a sledgehammer and I found this round rock and I hit the rock with a sledgehammer and it opened up. And there was this amazing crab and that was it. I was done. Unlike the representative Waukensha, I was going to become a paleontologist. <laughs> and then, of course, I, I tumbled into the Burke Museum. By the age of 13, my uh, mother was fully fed up with driving me to fossil sites at all times, everywhere. And she figured if she deposited me at the museum, somebody else would do it for her. And strangely enough, that was true. Uh, the Burke Museum is an amazing place. I mean, it, it, in many ways, it's, it's this fabulous testimony to Bill Holm, the, uh, the person who really did the analysis of Pacific Northwest Coast art. Amazing book he published in 1965. Many of the, the totem poles out front are actually carved by Bill. He's still there. He's been a, a, a feature of the museum for the last um, 50 years. And the museum, to me, kind of, it just has this great feel of the Northwest. It's where you see the Pacific Northwest Coast art, the fossils, the flowers, the birds. It's the place that holds the natural story and the cultural story of this landscape. And uh, I met this guy. This is Wes Weir, who was, uh, we thought he was a paleontologist. He was actually in the paleontology department when I was told to call him. But it turned out he was an artist who liked fossils a lot. Um, and the Burke was accepting volunteers, and he volunteered to become the curator of the fossil plant collection um, while being an artist. And I met him in 1974, and we became close friends until he passed away in 2004. Amazing guy who taught me a lot about art and fossils and correspondence with famous people. And he did these amazing little drawings. He, he was a, a man who lived his life in miniature. He had everything in a little bag. He carried a small bag with him, and his entire art show would fit into this little bag. He, he always, he never had a car. He just, he just walked around carrying his bag full of his life that was all in miniature. And one of his characteristics was that he could not drive. He'd never driven a car. He'd never owned a car. So even though he wanted to take me to fossil sites, he couldn't do it because he couldn't drive. So I got my driver's license, and we immediately set off on fossil hunting trips in Washington State. And we went to a place in northeastern Washington called Republic, which is a gold mining town in northeastern Washington, where there in 1929 had been a report of some fossil leaves. And then some woman from Republic had called the Burke and said, there are fossil flowers at Republic. And no one had ever heard of a fossil flower, so we're like, we gotta go find those fossil flowers. So we drove to Republic, and this is what Republic looks like. It's just one main street going up the town. And we looked around, and there was outcrops full of rocks. We could find no fossils at all. No one knew where the fossils were. No one could know, tell us where the lady with the fossil flower was. And uh, so we decided to leave. And as we were walking around to leave, I walked around the side of the car, and I kicked a little rock, this little rock, and it popped open. 
I was like, that's nice. <laughs> so we commenced digging in the ditch at the side of Main Street in Republic. And the ditch was full of amazing fossils. It had exquisite things in this rock that's called paper shale. You can take this rock and split it like the pages of a book. And it's really fun because you can just take a rock and split it. And it'll split 10 or 15 times. And each page will pop open with some different little message from the past in it. And we found exquisite fossils there. Extraordinarily preserved things in the ditch at the edge of Main Street in downtown. And we found out there were lots of flowers there, actually, it turns out. And uh, beautiful things. And one of the crazy things was that many of the fossils that were here not only were they not plants that were living in uh, anymore, they were not living in North America anymore, they were plants that were still living in Japan and China. So if you've been to the Arboretum here at the university, there's lots of Asian plants. So here are fossils of things that were alive in the Arboretum and alive in China, but never alive in North America in historical times. And it turns out there's an amazing story of the extinct Asian floras of North America that's told by Republic. And when I went back east to college, I would recognize trees because I'd seen them first as fossils in Republic. So I uh, then, by the time I left to go to college in 1977, not knowing I would never come back to live here permanently, I was firmly on a, a trajectory to become a paleontologist and a museum person. And when I left Seattle, Seattle was a very different place than it is today. I mean, you would, in 1977, there were still trucks that carried giant old growth trees around. There was still a commercial salmon fishing industry in Puget Sound. Starbucks was a coffee shop. <laughs> REI was a store. Eddie Bauer was actually a guy who we saw fishing out at Nia Bay. <laughs> Starbucks had not yet moved to Bellevue. Costco was five years in the future. Amazon.com was 19 years in the future. There were only 4.2 billion people on the planet. Now there's 7.2. And the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was only 332 parts per million. Now it's 400. So a lot's changed since I left. And interestingly, in 1977, nobody in Seattle really thought about volcanoes or earthquakes or landslides or tsunamis or any of those things. It just wasn't part of the conversation. And as I said, we laughed at people who lived in California because they were stupid to live in a dangerous place. <laughs> so then two years later, Mount St. Helens exploded. Uh, and you know, I gotta say, we didn't see that one coming. Right? It just, <laughs> And dad heard it, he was out mowing the lawn, and he, it sounded like a basketball had been thrown against the side of the house. And uh, it was the explosion of this mountain in, a, in a, a, quite a violent way. Made people kind of think about geology in Washington in a way that most people hadn't been thinking about geology. They were calling things like the volcanoes, well that's an extinct volcano, as if volcanoes go extinct. So, Having all that kind of background, I, I went off with the goal of becoming a geologist. And, and geology is a really interesting thing because humans are sort of medium-sized apes. And it's hard for us to see things that are a lot bigger than us or a lot smaller than us and things that are a lot faster than us and a lot slower than us. So it's very difficult for us to recognize geologic processes because they're big and slow or sometimes big and very fast. And it's, it's a challenging thing to think about the Earth, which is very dynamic. The Earth is changing all the time. But as a medium-sized ape, it doesn't seem like it's changing at all. You kind of reset your daily clock every day and go about your day. It doesn't look that different. But in fact, things are changing very rapidly. So I set about trying to understand the world. And I spent the next 35 years traveling the world, looking for fossils and trying to solve mysteries of the planet. And I got really lucky very early in my career to go to the very high Arctic, the very top of the world. And on this map, here's the Arctic Circle. And I spent two summers right after leaving Seattle up there on Ellesmere Island, which is the highest of the Canadian Arctic Islands. It's an amazing place because going to the extreme parts of the planet help you understand how the planet really works. And we spent uh, two full summers uh, moving. Every week we would move by helicopter to a different spot of this island that's the size of Great Britain and has 200 people on it. And there are incredible things like actual ice sheets. The kind of ice sheets that were here in Seattle 15,000 years ago are still there on Ellesmere Island now. And it's a very difficult picture to understand what you're seeing, but that's a 300 foot high waterfall right there. So this isn't a glacier, this is a, an ice sheet. It's a big sheet of ice that's sitting on top of the landscape. At its core, it's several thousand feet thick. At its edge, it's 300 feet thick. 
And it's this kind of thing that during ice ages moves to southern latitudes and comes to places like Seattle. Um, here's me at the bottom of that cliff of ice. But as we flew around this landscape, which is 2,000 miles north of the nearest living tree, we were searching for fossils from a different time, a time in the past, and we'd land at these giant coal seams, and those rubbly piles of rock you see in the middle of the coal seams are in fact fossilized tree trunks sticking out. And we found actually standing in place tree trunks, and in fact whole fossilized forests. And when we dug into the bottom of the fossilized forest, we found the same thing that I found at Republic. In fact, lots of the same stuff I found at Republic. In fact, we were tapping into some knowledge that had accrued over the last hundred years that the high Arctic all the way around the world was once a continuous forest. And in fact, it's anomalous for the poles to be frigid and ice covered. The more common condition is for them to be forested. Not something you hear about in class very often. It was amazing to see it. When we looked for the fossil animals that were with these plants, we found crocodiles and turtles and snakes at a latitude 2,000 miles above the Arctic Circle. So today, where the mean annual temperature of the Arctic is minus 30 degrees centigrade, when these plants and animals were living, it was plus 12, 40 degrees centigrade different. Really dramatic evidence that the Earth's climate moves in huge ways. Here's a fossil of a lotus, and here's a reconstruction of what that landscape looked like 50 million years ago when those coal seams were being formed. So that, those trips, in my earliest exploits out of Seattle really drove into my head the uh, reality of profound global change. And the question really then is how fast? Not if, but how fast? So I, I went into a career of, of looking for fossils and understanding ancient landscapes, and I grew to be able to look at layers of rock and see the landscapes that those layers of rock used to be, because layers of rock are just stacks of cross-sections of ancient landscapes. So I would look at a coal mine and I'd see the swamp that made that coal mine. And my friend Ray Troll, the artist, calls that time travel with a shovel. <laughs> and in fact, paleontology lets you go back in time in a way that no other device lets you go back in time. And fossils and geology lets you actually understand the history of the planet in a very profound way. And it's really fun because you never know what you're gonna find. And that's why you go looking for more because when you're in the endeavor of scientific research, you're searching and looking, and since you don't know what you're gonna find, it's always a surprise. And here's an example. We were on an outcrop in central Alberta looking for fossil leaves, and we found this thing, which, if you see the X-Acto knife for scale, that's a skull of a toothless animal, about nine inches long, and we kept digging, and what it, it was attached to was the rest of the body of the most complete dinosaur ever found in North America, an ostrich dinosaur would have been about nine feet long from head of, tip of the head to tip of the tail. And just by luck, because we were looking, we found this incredible animal. And, and it's very fun to find this stuff, and you don't ever want to stop. And so I didn't. And I spent the next 35 years, and I visited 1,400 different fossil sites on all continents um, and found incredible things, like this gigantic fish from Kansas or this beetle from Wyoming with the color pattern still preserved on its wingtips. And we visited other colleagues who found things like these palm fronds in Wyoming. Here's Wes. Um, Wes often joined me on these things. His benefit for getting me involved in paleontology was he then spent a lot of time with me traveling around the country looking at fossils. And because of my early relationship with Wes, I formed relationships with lots of different artists, but one of the most enduring relationships is one I have with this artist, Ray Troll, who lives in Ketchikan and is in the audience here somewhere tonight. Ray and I have been working together for 20 years, and Ray uh, is the t-shirt guru of Southeast Alaska, but he also has a love of fossils that was born because he grew up in Kansas where there's lots of fossils. And he's got an amazing way of reconstructing ancient landscapes and drawing quixotic little scenes. And there's Ray and I at the top of the pile of geologic time. And Ray and I did one book together, Cruising the Fossil Freeway, and the reason I've been coming back to Seattle more and more is that we're now working in a book about the geologic history of the West Coast from San Diego all the way up to Prudhoe Bay. And um, that book should come out in about two years, but it's, it's drawn me back to the West Coast in a very profound way. Here's a map that Ray did of the American West. And each of those images is based on a fossil that was found where it's shown on the map. And what you realize is that those fossils are actually everywhere. And all you need to know is how to look for them 
and in off you go, which is a great thing to know, and it's a great thing to share with children because they are the sources of curiosity, and um, even sometimes you can get adults interested in this kind of stuff. <laughs> it's never too late, you know. Um, so this sort of culminated for me in 2010 while working in the city that cannot be named in this city. Uh, <laughs> I got a phone call from a construction worker in Snowmass Village near Aspen. They were doing a little project on this reservoir that's located right there. And they had driven through a mammoth skeleton and we rushed out there and the workers are pulling ivory tusks of mastodons out of the ground. And we launched this incredible dig that lasted for 70 days. It involved 300 people. We moved 8,000 tons of dirt by hand and collected 6,000 bones with this shovel army. <laughs> and it was really kind of the culmination of my, all my childhood dreams to lead a shovel army into the mountains <laughs> and, and extract literally thousands of gigantic bones. And they were so well preserved, you could just pick them up and haul them off. It was quite... It was quite an amazing thing. Imagine 6,000 of these bones, things like the skull, this amazing bison latifrons, the skull at six feet five inches from horn tip to horn tip. Uh, incredible, incredible fossils. And this is the fauna we extracted from that lake in Aspen where no one even knew there were fossils until somebody stumbled upon them, which is the way it always happens. Mammoths and mastodons and camels and horses and deer and bison and ground sloths and about 50 other smaller animals and complete um, buried tree trunks and plants from a period of time between 70,000 years ago and 140,000 years ago. And then I was minding my own business, enjoying my life, and the Smithsonian called. And they said, it's time for you to leave the city that cannot be named and come to the other Washington. I'm like, well, it's not Seattle, but it'll do. Um, and I joined the Smithsonian 15 months ago. It, the Smithsonian is a very interesting organization. It is the world's largest museum complex. It's also research institutes. There's actually 30 different elements of the Smithsonian, 19 museums, the National Zoo, nine research institutes. They have operations in many countries and are active in over 120 countries. It was founded in 1835 based on the bequest of an English scientist who had never been in the United States, but something about the United States uh, warmed his heart and he, in his will, left his fortune to the United States government to found in the city of Washington an institution for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. In 1846, the Smithsonian opened on the mall. This is the Smithsonian Castle as it appeared in its early days. It's still there looking just like this. But this one building has grown to um, dozens of buildings. And if you go to Washington, the National Mall is actually lined with Smithsonian museums. And what's so cool about this is, and I had a French visitor a couple of weeks ago, who said to me, it's amazing, your government wraps itself in museums. And I like that concept. We see in the mall in Washington, D.C. every year, the Smithsonian writ large sees 30 million visitors, which is, if you think about it, 10% of the population of the country. It really is the nation's museum. And most of those visitors are unique. Most of them don't come from Washington, D.C. They come from all around the country, from the towns that don't have museums that can attend. And it's an amazing place to work. The Natural History Museum, of which I'm the director, is this one right here. That's a 1.3 million square foot building. And it, we have other facilities as well that bring a number over 2 million. Here's this staff of this museum. We see 8 million visitors. We have 120 million objects. And over 500 scientists and affiliated scholars. It is an uh, amazing behind the scenes operation. 80% of this operation is behind the scenes. Scientists are working in many countries describing new species, making new discoveries. And when you come and look at the exhibits, you're looking literally at the tip of the iceberg. And this is what we are thinking about how we now make this a natural, national museum by not just having the people come to us, by bringing the museum and partnering with local museums like the Burke. And of course, the Burke was my first choice of a museum to partner with. Our vision is understanding the natural world and our place in it. It's a pretty simple, straightforward vision. It maps really well onto what I've been doing for my entire life, both in Seattle and out of Seattle, just cruising around trying to figure it out and figure out what our role and our place in it is. We have incredible collections um, from literally all over the world. That map on the top shows where our collections come from. So pretty much everywhere, 
except not so many from Russia. <laughs> Wonder why. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that's really been amazing to me as I, as I continue to look at change and try and measure rates of change is to um, think about what we've learned since I left Seattle, since the 60s. And, and I don't feel that all. I mean, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm 53, and I, but I can remember very clearly being a high school student in this town and feeling more or less like I am right now. But that's 35 years ago, and so much has happened in the world of science and knowledge acquisition. It's hard to even comprehend how much things have changed. And you know this in your own lives. You know that you're using iPhones or before you used to use typewriters and stuff like that or handwrite things. But if you just think about the changes happening in your life, somehow we as humans kind of assimilate change and think, oh, it hasn't changed that much. I still drive around in a car, but you know, 100 years ago you weren't driving around in cars. So I just wanna share with you five different areas where science has changed so much since I left high school that it's hard to imagine that we didn't know this when I was in high school, but we didn't. In the arena of living things, we continue to find new species at a staggering rate. These are just different organisms that we're dredging out of the um, Monterey Channel. The Smithsonian scientists work with the Ambari scientists. And there's lots of parts of the ocean that have never been sampled. And lots of parts of the water column that we've never been able to capture animals live in. Now with submersibles, we're going down and capturing whole suites of animals we never saw or knew of before, and you start to realize that we're a long ways away from knowing actually what lives in the planet at all. We preserve that stuff in the museum, and we have uh, a place where we preserve, for instance, the world's largest whale collection. And that's not just because we have the largest actual whale, but it's the largest collection of whales as well. And this is a, a lower jaws of an Antarctic blue whale. Each jawbone weighs about a ton. Can you imagine chewing? If you had a jaw that weighed a ton. We have a website called the Encyclopedia of Life. And when I was talking to the Smithsonian about joining the museum, they told me, we're making a website that has a page for every species on the planet. And I said, that's impossible. There's 1.9 million species on the planet. And they said, we are at 1.1 million already. And I said, OK. <laughs> now we're at 1.36 million. It's an amazing website. And it will continue to be amazing because we'll be able to use this website and sequester collections. So we'll be able to make the biota of Seattle or the biota of Green Lake or the biota of the Arboretum. Anywhere you have a geographically defined place, we can use EOL and make the biota of that place and build a reliable international database of all life on the planet. And of course, once we know that, we can start to really kind of put truth to Darwin's insight, which is that all things that are alive are related. That was his insight. That was why it was so hard for people to conceive of, that, that things evolved into other things. The concept of evolution is a, not an obvious nor intuitive concept. It was a discovery made by Darwin because he was looking and he discovered something. And this concept that marine mammals evolved from terrestrial mammals was a concept until the fossils were found that demonstrated that process. And as things move forward, we recall 60 years ago, Watson and Crick discovered DNA, but it was only 10 years ago that the human genome was sequenced. And we're starting to look at what the real tree of life is, and humans are right there. And how all 1.9 million of those things are related is starting to be within our grasp. With the sequencing of the human genome in 2003, a project that took 10 years and $2.7 billion, the rate of advance of technology now is such that that same genome could be sequenced in two weeks for $1,000. I'm gonna get my genome sequenced. I don't know about you, it sounds like a cool idea. <laughs> um, we have a nice exhibit about that because you think about the remnants, so you think, who cares about genomes? Well, it turns out that the, the big forward advances in medicine are gonna come from understanding the genetic basis of disease. And not only of human disease, but many of our diseases and our interactions come with other animals and understanding their genome will be important for understanding what's going on with our genome. So we've launched a major initiative at the Smithsonian called the Global Genome Initiative, which is really to try and tackle the genomes of the other living things in the planet, not just humans. It's a major effort which is involving organizations all around the world, all centered in the Natural History Museum in, in Washington, D.C. 
So that's life. Time is something that's kind of interesting because you don't know how fast change happens unless you can measure time somehow. And you can measure time in your own life by looking at a clock. But how can you measure time that happened 300 years ago or 3,000 years ago or 3 million years ago or 30 million years ago? You need to have tools. And it turns out those tools are discovered at the turn of the century by Marie Curie, who discovered radioactivity. And this amazing guy, Arthur Holmes, who lived into the 60s, but 1910, in his senior thesis project at Oxford, he dated a rock using radioactivity, and he dated the rock to be 400 million years old. And everybody laughed at him, but he continued working on this, and he single-handedly built the geologic time scale that we use today. And it was the advances of the Manhattan Project and eventually high-tech things like mass spectrometers that allow us now to use little crystals from volcanic eruptions to precisely date things ranging from the age of the Earth, which is 4.567 billion years, to the earliest humans that are known. And all that is a toolkit that we didn't have before 1950, and it continues to get more precise every year. It's amazing. So the numbers you see on this column to the right are getting more precise every year at an incredible rate. When I left Seattle, we could date rocks to the precision of plus or minus a couple of percent. Now we can date them with a precision of plus or minus 1 50th of a percent. We know precisely when things happen, which means you can say precisely how long they took to happen, which means you can understand rates in the Earth's history. Location, where does something exist? And we know now that the continents move, they drift around, which is not something that was particularly intuitive either. Again, a brilliant person at the turn of the century had the idea, was laughed out of the room. More brilliant people attacked this problem. Harry Hess in 1969 moved, when I was nine years old, moved the thought in the scientific community from opposed to continental drift to supporting continental drift and created a model for understanding how continents drift across oceans and how ocean floors are created in the middle of oceans and then ocean floors are subducted at the edge of oceans and the ocean floor is, an, is actually a factory for making more ocean floor and for moving continents around. And on a map like this of the world, the color of the ocean floor tells you how old the ocean floor is. So the ocean floor is always being created and being churned away and ocean floor is much younger than continents. It's an amazing insight we didn't have until the 60s and 70s. And of course, death. Uh, you think of things dying, but the death I speak of is extinction, when a whole species goes extinct. And the most amazing discovery in my time was the perception that an asteroid could cause an extinction. And this guy, Walter Alvarez, discovered this concept in 1980, working in Italy proposed based on just the thinnest little signature of geochemical evidence that there was an asteroid that had hit near um, the time when the dinosaurs went extinct, that he proposed that an asteroid caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. And it confused everybody, and no one believed him, but man, he was right. An asteroid that was six miles in diameter, traveling at 20 times the speed of a bullet, hit the Yucatan coasts of Mexico, it made a hole that was 25 miles deep and a mile wide. That hole collapsed, making a hole that was 180 miles wide and two miles deep. The explosion set off a chain reaction that caused the extinction of every animal on land larger than the dog. Took out all the dinosaurs. Everything that lives on the planet today is a descendant of some organism that survived this horrible event. You can see the thing punching in. And Remember, just last February, when the Chelyabinsk meteorite blew up over Russia, these things happen all the time. It was a danger we weren't even aware of when I left Seattle. And now we're acutely aware that it can blow out windows in Russia, or it can cause the extinction of everything big on the planet. Don't worry about it. <laughs> right, it comes down to timing, right? If it happens all the time, it's something to worry about, but it happens very, very infrequently. Maybe not so much. It does actually matter when things happen and how fast they happen for your peace of mind. <laughs> this is the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, and you can see that, that those cenotes of the Mayans, those wells that you see in National Geographic magazine, are actually um, the edge of the crater, which goes out into the Gulf of Mexico, 180 kilometers in diameter, two miles deep, a big insult to the planet. 
And the debris from that stuff rained down across the world. And here's Rachel and I at a site in North Dakota that we discovered where this little layer is the debris from the asteroid that was blown from the crater in the Yucatan all the way to North Dakota and laid down in a layer. And what's cool about this place is this place is full of dinosaurs. So if you walk around, you find dinosaurs. And here's that layer up there. It's called the Kiti Boundary. There's a triceratops skeleton down below. And what you realize is you find tons and tons of dinosaurs below the layer, but none above. It's sort of the test. Did the asteroid kill the dinosaurs? And the answer looks like probably. Here's a dinosaur lying in the ground. Here's how you find them. This one was filleted by erosion. So you can see a, a leg there. There's some ribs. There's a leg. There's a foot. There's a head over there. This animal, we put jacket on it, flipped it over, and it's on display in Tokyo, the National Science Museum of Japan. There it is. And these things, like triceratops, they're common. If you want to find a triceratops, go look for one. There are hundreds of them out there. <laughs> and, and they're fun. Here's one of my colleagues, Rich Barkley, who is also from Washington State, from Spokane. And he and I worked on a project to locate that layer, that a layer from the, from the asteroid. And we found it in, in a place in eastern Colorado. Rich's got his finger on that layer. It's right there. There's dinosaurs below and none above. But also are layers of white volcanic ash, which is great because we can actually use those crystals to date precisely those things and actually ask the question, when did the thing happen? When we did that, we get the most precise numbers there are. 6608, 6606 million years. So the, the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs landed sometime between 6606 million years ago and 6608 million years ago. So we know precisely when that event happened, which is kind of interesting. And then the final thing, which is sort of the last one to join the fold, was our understanding of climate has come on strong in the 80s. And in part it was because of groups like the Quaternary Research Center, which started here at the University of Washington in the 60s and really took off in the 80s, people who were really interested in how the Earth's planet changed over time. And there's a, this interesting thing I mentioned a little bit earlier that the Earth's climate has sort of two states. There's a times when the Earth is warm and the poles are forested, and there are times when the Earth is cooler and the poles are covered by ice. Ice house, greenhouse. And of course, we live in an ice house world today because the poles are covered in ice, not forest. But it turns out that ice house is the non-common condition. About 15% of Earth history is, is ice house. About 85% is greenhouse. And um, that, that's not something that most people know, that the poles sometimes look like this, and they sometimes look like this. It's just a matter of the climate changing over great spans. And there have been incredible advances in this knowledge as well, using a variety of techniques, like drilling the ice cores or drilling the sea floors. But in 2005, an American European group used icebreakers to bust their way into the middle of the Arctic Ocean, and they drilled a well at the bottom of the middle of the Arctic Ocean in the middle of the Arctic seafloor. And they brought up layers of mud that were 50 million years old from the time when there were crocodiles up there. And what they found were not even evidence of saltwater organisms, but actually from the bottom of the seafloor, they found the spores of a floating aquatic fern called Azola. And they got direct evidence that the Arctic Ocean 50 million years ago was actually a freshwater lake sitting on top of a fresh lens of freshwater sitting on top of salt water, and it was covered in floating aquatic ferns. Now, here's a lake covered by floating aquatic ferns in the Amazon. But imagine that as your Arctic Ocean 50 million years ago. And you realize how dramatic climate change can be, which asks the question, what's the rate? How fast does it change? And we're learning a lot about that by drilling the ice caps. And during ice house Earth, when the Earth is cold, there are times when it gets even colder and ice moves from the high latitudes down to the mid latitudes. So here's what it looks like today, but 15,000 years ago it looked like this. And you can see Seattle in this situation is a little bit bleak. <laughs> right? And we know, even from work done here in Puget Sound, that this happened at least six times in the last two million years in Puget Sound. We know from cores in the rest of the Earth that over the last two million years, this event happened about 20 times. 
the advance and the retreat, and the advance and the retreat. This isn't that long ago. The last time it looked like this was 15,000 years ago, which is only like three times as old as the pyramids. So again, the ability to measure time and map the rates of climate are kind of important, which brings me back to Seattle. So I'm back now. Hi. <laughs> it's really nice to be back, actually, because in the 35 years I've been gone, amazing scientists have been making amazing discoveries. And when Ray and I decided to um, start working on a book on the West Coast, it was like going to a candy shop. The, the number of discoveries of scientific things and geologic things and paleoclimatic things and fossils were endless. And, and Ray and I have spent 190 days driving, flying, floating the West Coast all the way from San Diego all up to Prudhoe Bay. And everywhere we go, we interact and, and interview scientists and visit museums, look at museum collections. And it's been incredible. And one of the epicenters of that is right here in Seattle, University of Washington, the Burke Museum, the, um, the College of the Environment here at the University of Washington, the Quaternary Research Center. The people here are doing amazing work, making amazing discoveries. They're working in cooperation with the state, the U.S. Geological Survey. And they're finding stuff that, that blows my mind. So Ray and I are driving in in our truck, and we're headed your way. Here's Ray, slaving away. Ray's out there rowing towards this site in eastern Washington where a rhinoceros was overrun by a lava flow. And then didn't get it out, and the lava surrounded him, and he baked in the lava, leaving a rhinoceros-shaped hole in the lava, which was discovered in 1943. And we rode out across this lake and climbed up the hill, and up on the top of the hill, we crawled into a hole that was the shape of a rhinoceros that got covered up by lava 15 million years ago. That's the kind of stuff you can do in Washington State. It's a very nice state. Um, <laughs> We're thinking about Washington differently, too. When I, when I lived here, we talked about Puget Sound. But now we're saying, you know, actually, this is Puget Sound is part of this big inland sea that we're calling the Salish Sea. And uh, if you go down to the fisheries building, there's this incredible mural that Ray painted of all the fishes in the Salish Sea. There's 215 different kinds of fishes that lived in Puget Sound and the Salish Sea. It's an amazing thing. But because of the way that we've managed our fisheries, now the estimates are that 70% of the biomass of Puget Sound is not salmon, it's ratfish. <laughs> now, if you like ratfish, that's great. If you like salmon, maybe not so much. So um, Ray and I are working on maps, like the ones we did, showing fossil discoveries around Washington State. And, and everywhere we go, we find people who are finding fossils or scientists who are studying these things, and we're, we're basically trying to tell the story of the West Coast of the United States all the way. There's amazing things. For instance, things like the saber-toothed salmon, a plankton-eating salmon that was 10 feet long. Talk about locks, right? Or giant sloths. Here's a ground sloth. When they were constructing SeaTac Airport, they found a fossil ground sloth while they were digging a post hole to put a light fixture in. Where do you see it? You see it over at the Burke Museum. So a lot of these things are in museums, but often they're behind the scenes, or if you don't know how to look for them, you don't realize how cool the stories are. But in a way, what's even more amazing to me about what's happened here in the Pacific Northwest is some really profound understanding about how the Northwest got to be the way it is. And I'll give you one example of this, our understanding that we, we kind of started to realize that continents were moving, but what we didn't realize for a long time is that parts of continents also move, these little blocks called terrains. And it turns out that the west coast of North America has blocks of continent the size of states that move, and they bump their way up along the coast. And all the way from Mexico to Washington, from Washington to British Columbia, from British Columbia to Alaska, a series of little tiny micro state-sized blocks are tumbling their way up. And here's one. This idea is that this block moved up and emplaced itself right there. And that Western Washington actually originated in Baja, California. And it's quite an amazing thing, because if that were true, then you would expect to find fossils here today that 
when they were deposited had tropical affinities, and in fact, you do. And you can look at other techniques to show you that these trains have actually moved north. So not only are the continents moving, but the edges of the continents are bounding along and tumbling forward, and it makes for really confusing geology that is now being pieced apart by amazing geologists. Things like the, the rain, uh, the uh, warm forest I showed you in the Arctic, if it's warm in the Arctic, what's it like in Washington State? And work done up in Bellingham by the guys at the Western Washington University show that there were tropical rainforests in Washington, not conifer forests. You think about the Pacific Northwest Coast um, temperate rainforest, and that's our forest. Well, that's only been our forest for a little while, because in the past we had things like palm trees and gigantic tropical rainforest leaves in Bellingham. And if you drive, check on a drive, you can see these things sticking out on the side of the road, or you can walk over to the Burke Museum and see them out behind the patio. And when I left Seattle, there were certainly none of these signs around, because there had been no eruption of Mount St. Helens. And suddenly people said, wait a minute, uh, what about that thing? <laughs> it was such a lovely mountain. We like to climb it. And then some astute geologists pointed out, it's like, um, you live in Tacoma and that thing is uphill and you're downhill, <laughs> which is an obvious thing. But um, here's a map showing Mount Rainier. The top of Mount Rainier is, you can see it there. My pointer is not pointing right there. There's Tacoma. And these brown lines, the river valleys, show the flow paths of these mud flows called lahars. And lahars are flows of mud and rock and debris that come off of volcanoes. And they can come off in one of three ways. They can come off if the volcano erupts, they'll come off. They can come off if there's an earthquake which shakes it and they can fall and come off. Or they just come off if they feel like it. <laughs> because the mountain's up and it wants to go down. So you can ask the question, how much warning do you get if a lahar is going to come? You can say, well, if you know the mountain's going to erupt, you might get some warning. Or if you feel an earthquake, you might get some warning. Or you might not get any warning at all. And Lahars travel at about 40 or 50 miles an hour. So if you live in one of those brown zones, you now pay attention to those signs. And the thing you do is when you get some warning, whether it's 15 minutes or 45 minutes or two days, you go uphill and get out of the low-lying area. But what's amazing is that this Lahar, Tacoma, is built on that Lahar. And this one goes up into the Duwamish. So if Mount Rainier did go off, you'd get a couple hours of warning. Last time it erupted was 1894. And, um, you know, just something to pay attention to. Again, rates are important, if you're going to worry about it or not. The Smithsonian maintains a global catalog of all the volcanoes in the world. And here's a question for you. How many active volcanoes are there in the world. It turns out that we know of at least 1,554 volcanoes that are active in the world. They've erupted, and we, we call them active if they've erupted any time in the last 10,000 years. And we have a catalog of over 11,000 eruptions of those 1,500 volcanoes. And we're really curious about how many people live next to volcanoes. So it turns out, on this map, the color of the, of the little triangles the, the warmer the color is the number of people living within 30 kilometers of a volcano. So you can see that we're actually not too bad in Washington State. A little bit worse in Central America. Java is in sort of the hot spot, and there's um, Vesuvius in Naples. So you can sort of see the, the people who have the most potential for having a bad day with a volcano. Um, and we track that, and we share this information with the Washington State and USGS, because volcanoes are always going off, and new ones are popping off all the time. And it's this kind of knowledge base that helps us start to manage the risk and understand the rates. Uh, so back to Seattle on the ice. This is, in some ways, the thing I felt really the most cheated on, because we knew that Puget Sound was formed by ice as early as 1900. But no one ever told me when I lived here that Seattle was the southern edge of this great big Cordilleran ice sheet, and that Puget Sound was completely covered in ice as recently as 15,000 years ago, and that Seattle itself was under 3,000 feet of ice, which seems crazy, right? So here's, here's my little mental trick with you. It, the ice, when it moves south, moves south at about 150 yards per year. 
So if I had graduated from high school 18,000 years ago in Seattle, and then I went away for 35 years and came back, here's how far the ice would have gone. Here's the um, space needle. There's the edge of the ice. There's the Smith Tower. Okay, this is me graduating from high school. I come back 35 years later, and that's how far the ice would have moved. In the time between I, when I went, left high school and came back to give this talk to you. So, but what's really amazing is this. That 15,000 years ago, the ice in Seattle was five space needles deep. 3,000 feet of ice in downtown Seattle 15,000 years ago. You think they would have told us that, right? <laughs> that should be basic information for Seattleites. And if you look at Puget Sound, you realize, and I ask myself, and I always, every once in a while, I look out the window and say, why does something look the way it looks? But ask yourself, why does Puget Sound look like this? What are these things? What are all these channels in Puget Sound? What's Lake Washington, Lake Sammamish, the Columbia River? What are, those, what are those channels? And it turns out that when you ask that question, to most people, they go, uh, I don't know. I, test, I tested it this week. I've talked to a lot of Seattleites and asked them why Puget Sound is shaped the way Puget Sound is shaped. And most people say, I don't know. And in fact, I didn't know three weeks ago either. So I asked a glaciologist. And, and what these channels are is when the ice was here, and when the ice was 3,000 feet thick, there was meltwater under the ice, and the meltwater carved out the channels underneath the ice, and the water flowed underneath the ice out to the south here, and across the little divide and into the Chehalis River and dumped out by Aberdeen into the ocean. And all these channels were formed when the ice was here, they formed underneath the ice. And the thing that's weird is that down here is higher than down here, which means that the water was under pressure, so it was squirting up and out of the bottom of Puget Sound and into the Chehalis River Valley and going out. And that landscape that we live on is a subglacial landscape. Who knew? Lots of cool techniques have developed as well. This is a, a really cool map. This is what we call a LIDAR map. It's basically an airplane flies over a landscape and sends a laser down and bounces off the ground. And it can bounce off treetops and the ground, but it can subtract digitally the treetops so it sees a very clear picture of the ground. And what you see is a map of Bainbridge Island. This is Bainbridge. The ferry comes in right in there. And there's two things I point out. One is this very distinctive north-south scoured pattern. And what you're seeing is what are called drumlins. The ice has sculpted every single bit of Bainbridge Island. But what's also really cool is, if you look at this carefully, there's a cut right there. See that little line? That's a geologic fault. A fault is when rock breaks and moves. And some faults happen underground, you don't see them, but sometimes they break and actually move the surface. And that cut is at the surface. And when that fault moved, it actually broke the surface of the ground. And that's the edge of what they call the Seattle Fault that moved about 1,100 years ago. When it moved, it jumped up 20 feet into the air. That would have been an interesting day. <laughs> Have you ever been to Alki Point? 1,100 years ago, Alki Point was underwater. It came out of the water in a day. All that real estate there, that wasn't real estate. That was subtitle. It popped up. It's kind of amazing to think about how the landscape forms and how you can read the landscape using different tools. It's also cool to see these landscapes be recorded. And Dave Montgomery, who's a, a quaternary geologist here at the University of Washington, discovered this amazing fossilized salmon, salmon stream, where a million years ago, when the ice was in Puget Sound, salmon were spawning, as they spawn today, and dying in the stream. And you can actually see the fossilized salmon in the bottom of this ancient lake when Mammoths and mastodons were here, so Ray Troll's image gives you a sense of salmon fishing with mammoths and mastodons. And finally, this thing, who ever thought about tsunamis? I mean, you, you, we know about tsunamis now because the 2011 tsunami in Japan and the one that preceded it in Bandache, but in 1977, nobody was talking about tsunamis at all. But there was an amazing geologist named Brian Atwater who was searching the west coast of Washington state, looking at the mud along the coast in Long Island, Long, uh, Long, the south end south of Hoquiam. And he found a sand layer, which he thought might be evidence of a tsunami washing up on the shore of Washington. 
And as he deduced it and looked around, he kept looking and he found a forest that had dropped in to salt water, had been lowered by a, a, a fault into salt water. The forest had been killed. He was able to count the tree rings in the trees and say, this forest was drowned between 1680 and 1720. They thought that's, so I think there was an earthquake that caused a tsunami about 1680 to 1720. But then he started corresponding with Japanese scientists and in Japan, because they have a very solid bureaucratic system, they keep track of the tsunamis that hit. And in Japan, an earthquake will cause a tsunami. But in January of 1700, there was a tsunami that washed ashore in Japan that didn't have an earthquake associated with it. It was an earthquake that happened in Washington state the tsunami went all the way across and hit the coast of Japan. And using the Japanese administrative records, Atwater and his Japanese colleagues were able to actually precisely date the, size, the earthquake that happened in Washington State in the year 1700 on January 27th at noon. <laughs> it's about precision, right? And given the size of the waves that hit Japan, he could back calculate the size of the earthquake that made the tsunami that crashed into Japan. None of us had any idea that there were gigantic earthquakes in the coast that are driven by the subduction zone. So this subduction zone here, when it goes, it sets off really big earthquakes. The earthquakes that we have had recently in Seattle, like the 65 one that I felt, or the 2001 one that knocked down some of the buildings in, in Pioneer Square, are more modest quakes. This one, here's the Seattle Fault, Last time that went off was 900 AD. Again, it really matters. Different kinds of earthquakes have different kinds of causes. And it's amazing to me to think that I grew up right there. My dad lives in a house right there. And here is this thing called the Seattle Fault. We didn't know about the Seattle. Now, we should have known about the Seattle Fault because... There's Alki Point right there, and there's Restoration Point on Bainbridge, and there's that fault in the groove right there. And here are these very funny things called the Issaquah Alps. You heard about the Issaquah Alps? And there's lots of fossils and outcrop there, but here it's soft glacial till. And the very top end of the Duwamish River is cut off by this fault. But this is a fault where the south end is going up and the north end is going down. And that's why Alki Point is Alki Point. So the first... Settlers of Seattle landed there in 1851. If they had been there 1,100 years before, they could have ridden Elkai Point up 20 feet in a day. <laughs> is this amazing stuff? Like, I didn't know any of this stuff when I lived here. Um, and of course, um, there are so these three different kinds of uh, earthquakes here, the deep subduction ones, the big ones. The ones that are even lower that shake things like the Squally Quake and the ones that have to do with the Seattle Fault. But it turns out there's a fourth kind of earthquake in the Pacific Northwest. Do you know about? It is the Beast Quakes. <laughs> the, the fact that the fans at the Seahawks games can actually generate earthquakes of magnitude one to two is quite an amazing thing. And since the uh, volcanoes and earthquakes in Denver are extinct, I don't know what that means, but it, what's cool about this is that they're using the same techniques to measure fan enthusiasm as they're using to measure the safety of landscapes in Washington State. But what's so great about this is it's such a great way to communicate about the science of earthquakes and realizing what, what people can do and how we measure things. So that, that um, John Vidali and the guys at the North Pacific Northwest Earthquake um, Center have done this incredible job, or the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, an incredible job of seizing the moment of popular football lust <laughs> to communicate about earthquakes. So the final thing I leave you with is this really great map that appeared a couple of weeks ago, Jeffrey Lynn works in the architect's office here at the University of Washington. Um, in his spare time, just did a little mental experiment, which is this. He said, what if all the ice in Antarctica melted? If all of Antarctica melted, what would happen in Seattle? This is a thought experiment that he did. And he took the uh, map of Seattle and he increased sea level by 240 feet, which is how much sea level you rise if you melt Antarctica. And it's 
It's not an impossible thing. Antarctica has melted before, and it'll melt again. Again, the question is how fast, whether you want to worry about it or not. But I, I like this. He made this archipelago of Seattle. And what everybody does here when they look at this thing is they look and see if they would have waterfront property or not. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go away for another 35 years, and I will see you guys in 35 years, and thank you very much. So we have a, que a first question to start with. I changed my shirt, you'll notice. <laughs> Be quick. <laughs> uh, the question is from Jean uh, from Kirkland. If humans almost died out 70,000 years ago, and if flint and stone tools, as well as metal objects, have been found in coal and rock strata, could some form of tool makers have lived before, but gone extinct? That's an elaborate question. Wow, <laughs> yeah, you wanna look at it again? I mean, I think the, the issue is that human, our species first appears, their oldest uh -huh. fossils of Homo sapiens shows up about 200,000 years ago. And they, that population did wax and wane a little bit. There are some times when life was a little bit rougher than other times. But our predecessors, the Homo erectus, and even before that, the earlier hominids like Australopithecus are around at least four or five million years ago. We're pushing that family back. Some early hominids are even showing up at around five and six million years. So as, as far as we know, we're the only one that's making flint tools. Um, but again, more science comes out all the time. So you may want to say something about it because you're an archaeologist. You answered just fine. Thank Perfect. you. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so, um, from Bellevue, I think this is Brian, uh, will Bertha and the downtown tunnel be successful? Uh, excellent. <laughs> this is an excellent question, and we've all been um, really loving the whole concept of Bertha because of Underground Seattle, and that was... I was thinking about this whole thing, and I, um, last summer I met one of the Bertha engineers that talked at length about how they do this stuff. But I've also talked to a lot of the glacial geologists in Seattle, and I showed you that very sculpted landscape of Puget Sound. And those landforms are called drumlins, and they're basically made by the glaciers smearing rock and clay across the pre-existing landscape. So it's a combination of rasping and filling and rasping and filling, which means that the underground Seattle is tremendously complicated. It's not layer cake, it's actually the stacked, smeared layers. And most glacial geologists, when asked about Bertha, will say, we want to know what you find out. And I think that's a pretty fair way to look at it. They are tunneling into a very complex sequence of glacial deposits. And uh, we want to find out what they find out. I mean, it's, it's the cool thing about drilling is you get to see what's down there. And as you know, they've gone a little bit quiet in the news lately <laughs> as they've found something and they're kind of puzzling what to do. And uh, stay tuned. I mean, that's you're, you have a ringside seat for subterranean... Seattle geology. Pay attention. So the next question is from Lynn in Shaw Island, from Shaw Island. Uh, what can you say about the Anchorage earthquake that lifted land by 20 feet? So the earthquakes will do this. They'll either lift or submerge land depending on what's going on. And they can do it quite abruptly. And that's what's amazing about earthquakes is that if you drive around the Pacific Northwest and see these terraces like Alki or Restoration Point, you realize if you walk out there, you can often find things that are either elevated beaches or submerged marshes. So you can actually see if they went up or down. But the real point is, is that um, the landscape, which looks pretty stable and non-dynamic, every once in a while, in a day, Um. <laughs> no, 
I can't read it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting older. Time seems to be speeding up. Could that actually be true? <laughs> <laughs> that is a lovely question. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> That's a good one. So, um, what do you think is the effect of volcanic activity on diversity? Well, that's interesting. There's, I mean, volcanoes do a lot of things, and one of the things that we've noticed is that volcanoes actually create a mountain where there was no mountain before. They're kind of instant mountain creators, and then they blow the mountain up. I mean, volcanoes are very ephemeral things. You look at Mount St. Helens, it was beautiful, and then one day it went away, or most of it did. And so the fate of volcanoes is to create themselves and then to destroy themselves, geologically. But when they create themselves, they create elevation where there was no elevation before, and in many parts of the world that are warm, when you build a mountain, you get increased moisture. You create an orographic effect, and you get mountain-cladding rainforests, which are high-diversity areas. And we think um, that a number of the earliest tropical rainforests first formed on the slopes of elevated mountain ranges, and some of them were volcanoes. So some of the origin of tropical diversity might have to do with the creation of elevation rapidly. Hmm. Not so much different than other mountain ranges, but, but in many cases in Washington State and in Oregon, there are lots of fossil tropical rainforests, and they're associated with volcanic mountains. And perhaps the Cascades, the creation of the Cascades had something to do with diversity? Well, yeah, the, um, the, mountain, the Cascades themselves came up as an independent thing, not volcanic, and the volcanoes popped up through it. So you're getting mountains in two different ways. And I think what is clear is that the creation of topography enhances um, landscape heterogeneity, which enhances the potential for more diversity. So um, this is a question about, uh, first of all, how are fossils formed, and where can I go and see and touch the KT boundary? Ah. Wants to go on a trip with you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What donor level is that? <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, an auction <laughs> item. It's got to be an auction item. Fossils are easy. All you have to do is have something die and get buried, and then stay buried for a long time. Most things that die don't get buried. So most things that live and die don't become fossils because they don't get buried. So you need to die in a place where burial is happening, and burial happens where the landscape is sinking and where sediment's coming in. So you want to die in a place that's sinking. I want to be buried in the Mississippi Delta personally because I want to become a fossil. What was the second question? Um, where can they go to see the oh, KT boundary? The nearest KT boundary from here is located probably in eastern Montana, I would say. So, or you could drive. You could drive to Colorado or Montana. You have to go east of the Rockies to get a KT boundary. And in order to find the KT boundary, you have to find a place that was the surface of the Earth 66.08 million years ago and is still at the surface of the Earth today. Because if it was at the surface 68 million years ago and got buried, you can't go see it. Or if it got uplifted and eroded away, you can't go see it. So it has to be at the surface today and it had to be at the surface then. There's only a very few places. There's about 300 places around the world where we can do that. And the nearest ones are in Montana and Colorado. Are these locations available in roadside guides to geological roadside guides? Yeah, the most, probably the most accessible one is on the side of Interstate 25 near Trinidad, Colorado. And you can actually see the KT boundary, it looks like a white chalk line, and you can spot it at 65 miles an hour as you're driving by it. <laughs> you don't have to get out of your car. So Louise, uh, there you go. You live in Seattle, so you're on a road trip. <laughs> you're going to Colorado, whether you like it or not. <laughs> so what's your theory on how the dinosaurs um, in the city that can't be named died? <laughs> So the thing about dinosaurs is they lived for a long time on the planet. And in fact, we now know that birds are dinosaurs. So in some sort of semantic sense, dinosaurs never went extinct. But the things that we traditionally recognize as dinosaurs um, were on the planet from at least 230 million years ago until 66 million years ago. And there are many different kinds of them. So many kinds of dinosaurs came and went by evolution and extinction, by evolution and extinction. But the very last ones, 
are in place just below the layer of that debris from that asteroid. And so it's a pretty good argument that the asteroid had a direct cause and effect relationship on the demise of the dinosaurs. Probably about 60% of the scientists go that way. Almost and every topic you get, you get people on both sides of an argument, but that one seems to be a pretty good argument. And there are dinosaurs found in Denver? Yeah, the, the first Tyrannosaurus rex ever found was found in Denver, the first Triceratops ever found was found in Denver, first Allosaurus and first Brontosaurus were all found in the city limits of Denver. Any Broncos? Uh, <laughs> there, there are some fossil horses there, yes. <laughs> Just had to. Um, <laughs> if the water level rises 280 feet, mm -hmm. would the freezing level rise 280 feet? I don't know what is meant by freezing level. Well, uh, the, an interesting part of that question is if the water level rises 250 feet, how much warmer does the climate, does the world have to be to melt all that polar ice? That's the big question, right? The question is, uh, at what point do you heat the atmosphere enough that ice on the planet becomes unstable? Some people argue they're already there. And then the second question is, how long does it take to melt in Antarctica? We've never actually watched one melt before. Uh, but it's a pretty big block of ice. So if you take a big five pound block of ice and sit it on the sidewalk in a hot day, it doesn't melt instantly. It takes a certain amount of time because it's got a certain amount of thermal inertia. So it's, it's a very interesting question that everybody's interested in. In fact, uh, people like Eric Steig here at the University of Washington are asking that very question. How fast does it take to melt an ice sheet? That's actually quite a relevant question for the future of the planet in the next 100 years. If it melts fast, then sea level goes up fast. If it melts slow, sea level goes up slow. So we prefer a slow melting ice, all things being equal, to a rapidly melting ice. Uh, this question really is about the continents and how, what's the mechanism for uh, the bottom of the continents and how they move across the planet? That is an open question with geologists right now. Um, there's definitely something with heat and how heat moves in the mantle of the Earth. But that's one of those questions that we no is a question, but we don't know the answer. Hmm. Okay, two more. Why have no dinosaurs been found in the state of Washington? Because uh, the paleontologists are slackers here. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that actually, I was indiscreet on my part. Uh, <laughs> he, will, <laughs> he will pay for that. <laughs> It, it turns out that in order to find dinosaurs, you have to find rocks that are the age that dinosaurs were living. And those rocks are either Cretaceous, Jurassic, or Triassic. And Washington State does have some Cretaceous rocks, but most of them are marine. So you have a few rocks that are Cretaceous rocks and deposited on land. Those are mainly around Winthrop in the Meta Valley. And there have been some expeditions to that area to look for dinosaurs, but no one's found them as yet. So those specific paleontologists are slackers. <laughs> These all say the same thing. OK, four of you ask a similar question. With your many years in Denver at the museum and your prior years in Seattle, are you really rooting for the Broncos or <laughs> the Seahawks? <laughs> four people. That, that's an indiscreet question. <laughs> He's not answering it. We've been asking him for days, and he will not answer it. He hasn't been here for 35 years, though I think we know the answer. So with that, I want to thank Kirk Johnson very much for coming to Seattle. Thank you, Laura.